Hello, everyone. I'm Lynn Cremando for Yoga You Online, and I am delighted to be here today with yoga and meditation teacher, psychotherapist, and Hannah somatic educator, James Knight. James is the founder of a movement exploration technique called Gentle Somatic Yoga. Welcome, James. Hi, thank you. It's nice to be here with you. You coined the term integrative therapist for yourself to reflect the diversity of your many varied trainings, which include Watsu water therapy, body work, core energetics, biofeedback, and you're also on staff at a number of higher learning uh, organizations. And I think you are also a, one of the uh, lecturers for Maryland University's master's program, if I'm not mistaken. Lots of, uh, lots of varied experience, and we bring a lot of fullness of experience into our work. You certainly have a full roster of experience. What's brought you through all of those things to somatic yoga, and can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah. Um, gosh, where to start? Um, I've always been, one of my strongest passions is consciousness. And also learning about human potential and activating and creating experiences for people to really uh, drop into themselves to see what's possible. So back in the day, like 30 years ago, I started off with massage therapy and really got to know how to touch the body, anatomy, physiology. And I was really fortunate. My very first yoga teacher was Eleanor Criswell Hanna. And she was the creator of somatic yoga. So that was my very first yoga class was with her. And over years of taking um, her uh, course, it was at college, she um, recognized me. She saw me. You know, sometimes you come across people where, you know, the teacher appears and the student's ready. And she said, James, you know, I really think you should consider getting your certification in Hannah Somatic Education. And uh, so Thomas Hanna uh, died. So I'm, I'm going to back up a little bit. The science behind general somatic yoga is Hanna somatic education. So, um, so when she suggested that I take the certification, he had just passed in a tragic car accident. And he had trained uh, his first and only group to become certified as Hanna somatic educators. So that really started my path um, once I learned this important science um, I became really interested in all the other areas. Like I had, you know, the physical body and now then I wanted to learn about the psychology and then I wanted to learn energy medicine. And so that became really my, my driving force was like, let's continue looking at the whole self. You know, I want to back you up a little bit because uh, somatic yoga is a term that I see getting tossed around a lot right now. I'm not sure how many people really understand about Thomas Hanna. Can you talk about, and, and, and Eleanor, I mean, you kind of hit the mother load with your first yoga teacher. I know. I, mean, I have chills right now as we're talking because it's, it always touches me emotionally that I just happen to be at the right place at the right time. And Thomas Hanna was a living genius. Like he was really ahead of his time. And you would, know, would you say he really invented the somatic, wasn't that his life's work to just kind of the culmination of his life's work was the whole concept of somatic expression of movement? Yeah, I can share more about that. So he was, um, he was an academic and he was a lecturer and he was a philosopher. And so uh, through his career of writing books and teaching at universities, the topic that he was most interested was freedom. And he eventually came to the realization that without choices in our physical body, we're ultimately not free. And so that led him to discover Moshe Feldenkrais. At the time, Moshe Feldenkrais, um, are you aware of Moshe? Of course. Okay. Sure. So he, um, Thomas Hanna actually brought Moshe Feldenkrais to United States for the first time. I think they did a training at Esalen. Um, in the 70s, I believe. And so Thomas Hanna arranged that um, training and Thomas Hanna actually became a Feldenkrais, a certified Feldenkrais practitioner for about eight years. 
Um, and then through that practice of learning Feldenkrais, he had the inspiration to, because Feldenkrais uh, is heavily um, uh, interested in the sensory cortex part of the brain. And Thomas Hanna added bringing some movements that stimulated the motor cortex, the sensory and the motor cortex. So that was Thomas Hanna's contribution. And so uh, Thomas um, co <coughs> excuse me, coined a couple of things. He took the word soma or somatikos in Greek, which is the term for body, and he added an S, somatics. Somatics, with his definition, is experiencing the body from within. So that's one of the um, terms that he coined. Another term that he coined, which is a major part of the science behind general somatic yoga, is sensory motor amnesia. So sensory motor amnesia is where we've lost voluntary control, temporary <laughs> Uh, loss of voluntary control of muscles. And so um, in, in general somatic yoga, I've coined sense, um, somatic movement flows. So the somatic movement flows help a person switch back on and activate um, and strengthen the brain to muscle nervous system connection. And so we come out of sensory motor amnesia, meaning the loss, you know, pain, postural imbalances, numbness, uh, we, uh, natural alignment, and through the flows, we reawaken and stimulate the whole self. So I call it somatic um, SMA, um, sensory motor awakening. So, so Thomas Hanna was the founding father of this movement by helping, un, helping us understand how to do this. And so when I became certified as a Hanna somatic educator, it was a very extensive program, like three years. Very honored to be a part of that group. I was the third um, group of people, we call them waves in our tradition, the third wave of students um, to become certified, and that heavily influenced uh, my career. So that was like 25 years ago. Was that, uh, but, but you did uh, somatic, the Hannah uh, somatic practitioner, and you were also studying yoga, somatic yoga. Yeah, yeah. So, so backing up again, I'm, I'm yeah, just kind so of putting, a spiral. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to put them together in conversations. my head. Yeah, so let me yeah. help. So, so at Sonoma State, where I was going to school, I met Eleanor Criswell Hanna. So she's the one that invited me to take yeah. the course. So yeah. she um, created, I'm pretty sure, because there's she she uh, she created the method somatic yoga. So she took hatha yoga postures and asanas. And because she was married to Thomas Hanna, I'm sure that they created the Institute, the Nevada Institute of Research and Training. I always forget the way that the uh, names are arranged, but there's an institute where we get trained, and she helped him create the course. So she took the science of Hanna somatic education and started blending it with traditional yoga. And so she coined it somatic yoga. She wrote a book on it. And um, so she became my main mentor. So yeah, so I did both. So um, actually, when she turned department chair at Sonoma State, she asked me out of all of her students to teach somatic yoga. And it, it was so humbling because at that point, you know, I didn't even know about Yoga Alliance. I didn't have any other yoga teachers training behind my belt, but she just saw a potential in me and it was really an honor. So that's so, yes, I started off with teaching somatic yoga, which is traditional Hatha yoga postures with the science of Hanna somatic education, and that's that's where it started. How would a uh, yoga class that's informed by Hanna somatics what what would that look like? How would a gentle yoga somatics class look different from a gentle yoga class? So over the years, kind of like so, you know, moving forward from uh, twenty five years ago taking these other forms that I've mentioned, like biofeedback, mm -hmm. you know, I studied a lot shamanism, a lot heavily meditation, Vipassana meditation. As a yoga teacher, eventually I became certified as a yoga teacher. I have a lot of experience teaching traditional yoga in classes and studios, and I actually ran two wellness centers. So um, what happened was I started exploring, um, bringing in, the movements that Thomas Hanna and Feldenkrais created and bringing a slight twist to it because of my body work experience, my biofeedback experience, I started experimenting, um, bringing the flows into a traditional yoga class. And my students, 
it's just amazing to me because I was I was a little bit nervous because they're very different. They're not static poses. You know, they're they're you know we use interoception to uh, create intuitive movements through the body. Um, the difference between traditional hatha yoga and gentle somatic yoga is we're constantly um, checking in with ourselves. We're bringing, uh, we're hugging our muscles in towards our body so that we're engaging the sensory motor cortex. And then the appendiculation is to uh, slowly disengage those muscles slowly and smoothly and then come into a resting position. So we never hold a stretch. The intention is to never stretch a muscle or a muscle group, even though we are temporarily in stretching positions, it's more important that we use mindfulness to choose an anatomical focus and to mindfully engage that muscle group so that we can sense and feel and then we choose, that's the motor cortex, how to respond to that by slowly and smoothly releasing that muscle group and then come to full rest. So that's, that's a definition of pendiculation, um, which also Thomas Hanna coined. Well, it's, you know, a pendiculation, if you look it up in a dictionary, you usually see um, a person yawning in the dictionary because as we yawn, that's what we do. We temporarily engage the muscle groups of our jaws and then we slowly release and come back to rest. So that's what I've done with general somatic yoga is I've created uh, somatic movement flows to uh, explore and connect with different parts of our body. And through doing so, we unwind and unlock and reset, reprogram from the level of the brain, the resting length of the muscle. And that's the ultimate um, ex um, intention is to unwind from the stresses of life and the sensory motor amnesia and return to this optimal length of, of a resting muscle. It was, it's clear I've watched a lot of your videos on your various hundreds of video channels. <laughs> uh, and they're great, by the way. Oh, thank um, you. I like the one, I like to call it your deconstructed cat's pose, where it's, it's got four things. None of it looks like a yogic cat pose, but it's like when they give you a deconstructed lemon rang pie at the restaurant and there's a little lemon foam and then they spray. <laughs> I like where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I noticed a couple things is that you have a really intelligent use of contract and release along a specific chain. And there's a very deliberate methodical quality to your cues, to the way that you alert people to follow their bodies. And one of the things that uh, I think yoga teachers struggle with a lot is helping people to create uh, body awareness. And it seemed like that very methodical way where you just literally go one toe at a time or go from this elbow to that knee. To Can you talk a little bit about that process? Because I know you're working on so many levels there. Yeah, thank you for these questions. They're awesome. They're really, um, it's exciting to drop inside and to explain for first-time viewers or first-time people that don't know anything about this. You're yeah. asking great questions. Um, let me see if I can, how I can answer that. Um, so, one of, so, so first-person experience versus third-person experience, second or third-person experience. I think as, as mass, the mass collective, we're, we're often orienting ourselves to the external world and we're waiting for the feedback for our external world to help, you know, make decisions for ourselves. So to answer your question, the movements are designed so that the student, the participant, can start to discover, discover for themselves from the inside out um, how it's very intuitive, like, like the, the instructions from general somatic yoga are a portal for a person to start discovering how does that muscle move, you know, how, how do the joints and bones stack. So it's really this internal feeling process. It's a process of discovery and exploration where a person can refine parts of themselves that they may have disowned unconsciously through patterns of holding stress and tension for modern day life because you know like it or not our bodies are a map 
to our whole entire life experience, mentally, emotionally, physically. Mm -hmm. And we temporarily, like I mentioned earlier in the interview, we temporarily forget how to use our body because things, um, the, the muscles uh, stay unconsciously contracted even in resting states due to yes. a reflection of stress. So the movements, like you were, um, you were referring to this cat sequence, and we've, we've, I've actually renamed it Restore the Core, and it does come from the tradition of Hannah Somatic Education, but I've refined it to four movements with the intention for the participant to experience most of the major muscle groups in the body in four movements. And um, they also, I don't know if we have time to explore this, I'll leave it up to you, but there's three main reflexes that we want to address. And a reflex is something we don't have control of. For example, I'll just name one and we'll see if you want to expand with it. Mm -hmm. So the red light reflex is called the startle reflex. So all human beings and animals actually, if there was a loud noise to happen right now, like something like a, you know, a, a crash, all of us would, would hug our muscles in towards itself to protect our heart and our guts. It's just an instinct. It just happens automatically. Our head comes forward. Our shoulders come forward, our arms come forward. Just imagine coming into a fetal position. Now, that, so this is a reflex. It's just we don't even think about it. So the four movements in Restore the Core help us unwind from those reflexes because they become a subconscious pattern. And I can see that um, in my clients and my students is that we all each have a little bit of these three reflexes. So that is partly what we address with the somatic movement flows, particularly this one that you're, that you're talking about. But it's a systematically going through the entire body and reawakening the possibility of regaining control of that muscle and then resetting it through the brain to its most optimal length in a resting position. And none of that looks like what you're doing when you're talking about. You know, I know, I know. If you're just observing <laughs> from an outside person, you're like, what is that? It's like, well, you know, but, but, but you get, but like the deconstructed thing, you come away and you go, I just did yoga. Yes. Right. Yeah. I've reset things. I've got the yes. breath is working. Uh, yes. You know, it's, 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 it's incredible. Like every time I teach a class, it's the, the, it's so dramatic to watch people increase their range of motion in one class and once one movement flow. You, you can observe or you can, you can experience a, a pretty dramatic change. And that's what I love sharing with people because we didn't achieve that through stretching. It didn't come from stretching. It came from tuning inside and making choices for yourself how to move your body. So it's very empowering. It's, it's not rigid. It's fluid. It's a fluid discovery, a, a fluid movement through interoception you know, tuning inward and going, oh yeah, what is that? How does that work? You know, how do I do that odd movement? But the truth is Moshe um, and Thomas Hanna studied the movement of babies and animals. Because if you've ever watched a baby in a crib, they're pendiculating all the time. Their little hands and their little arms are just moving. You know, or if you have a cat or a dog, you know, they get up and they, they come in and they extend a limb and they bring it back in. And as humans, we do it too, but we're just not aware of it. Like if we've taken a nap or we sleep, you know, we just kind of like hug and squeeze. And so it's really quite natural um, to do that. So that's what the movements mirror is, you know, these, this hugging in and then moving away. And it, and it can look very strange for the first time. But I bet it feels amazing. I just did a few of them and they felt great. So yeah, it's, it's incredible because as, as your muscles return to a natural length, uh -huh. then your body just melts and we, re, we, we return back to our natural state, which is peace and well-being. When we strip away the layers of stress and habitual habits, habits of holding stress, it just brings us back into homeostasis, back into parasympathetic, and we feel free. We are free. And, and, and it's immediate. I think the other kind of point about that is um, people in general don't go to yoga class so they can improve their warrior too. Most people are going to yoga class because they want to feel better. They want to feel better in their bodies. They want to feel better in their lives. They want to sleep better. And so what it sounds like what you're providing really is not uh, a set of 
postures that are disjointed from what it's going to mean to you personally to do this practice. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, there's nothing, you know, it's definitely um, a, a lot of times, not for every yoga class or teacher, because there's so many talented teachers out there right now. We're, we're learning so quickly with modern science about the fascia and how the brain works, but I'm going to make a generalization. Is it a lot, typically in yoga classes, the, a lot of students want to like take it to the fullest expression, whatever, whatever the yoga posture is, you know, let's go deeper, let's get better alignment, let's stack, you know, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's, I mean, yoga is a science that's been around for 6,000 years that has tremendous benefits and it goes on and on. Um, but we take it a step further because what I have found out is that muscles don't really like to be stretched if the body's in pain. And... Right. With modern day yoga, again, I'm making generalizations, but it's more about fitness versus wellness. You know, there, it's just, you know, modern uh, yoga culture, it's just, um, it's not like what yoga, I, I believe what yoga was intended to do, which was, is to self-heal, to self-reflect. And so, so, so yeah, it's, it's not about, um, instead of saying what it isn't, I'm going to say what it is. Um, it's, it's. It's trusting your own somatic intelligence to come back to natural movement. And so natural movement is going to be different from each per for each person because everybody's body is not the same. Right. So the fluid movements are the process of unwinding from these stress patterns. Then each soma, because soma means body and mind are connected. Um, yeah, it, it just, it's... It's up to each person how they want to move and what feels right for them. And what I love about general somatic yoga is it's for everybody, for every ability, every age. All the somatic movement flows can be uh, customized. And each person can learn at their own pace. So it really is an unwinding process. Mm -hmm. And as that happens, more choices come back to the soma and so back to Thomas Hanna's interest in freedom ultimately that's what we get when we when we when we remove our armoring or our defense structures that we don't sometimes we don't even know we have but it shows up as pain and strain and postural imbalances then we're left with a, a soma that can be that can express itself on every single level the whole self is free when the physical body is unlocked yeah, as you were talking, it occurred to me when you said people come in for fitness, um, I kind of thought, well, people come in because they think they want fitness, but then what they get is not fitness, but I mean, they could get fitness out of it, but it's way more rich and a fulsome experience than uh, I developed some muscles in my arm uh, from doing that <laughs> you know, chaturanga sequence. Yes. Can I share something with you? Absolutely. I just spent the month in South Korea. Um, it was really an honor to be invited by a yoga studio there because they found gentle somatic yoga. One of their teachers took my online teacher's training certification. And the owner of the studio, um, it was a teacher from the studio. The owner of the studio had to translate in English the somatic movement flows. And they reached out to me, long story short, and they said, you know, we really think you're onto something. Would you mind coming and being our guest and being a would you like to co-create a new method of yoga, gentle yoga? We think that you have some pieces that could really be valuable. And I'm like, wow, yeah, I would love to go to Asia. I've never been to Asia. I travel around the world, but I haven't been to Asia. So I was shocked because um, I taught several classes, um, two classes a week, and I saw private clients. What I found interesting was the group was big. The classes were like 50 people. And the common theme was pain. Most of the yoga teachers, because mostly yoga teachers, live with pain as normal. It was normal. And I was just, I, I don't know, I, I kind of live in a magic, not a magic bubble, but you know, I, I live in a bubble. I live, I'm free in my body of pain. And, you know, so it was just, it was just kind of like a, an awakening that pain is normal. Like, I'm still processing it right now. You know, and so yeah. through doing the flows, they were they they realized, wait a minute, I don't have to be in pain. I don't I don't have to accept what people normal people say, the aging process. And the truth is no, we don't. Yeah. So I don't know if that answers your question back to fitness, is I think that 
you know, if there if there's pain, then sometimes we, we have this mentality, just keep pushing, you know, eventually we'll get there. You know, bad back, back knee, you know, shoulders, you know, let's keep, let's keep practicing, let's keep practicing. But it's still like, it's, I don't know. If, if, do you, are you tracking what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm actually tracking what you're saying. And it's reminding me of people who say, like, when I do this particular pose, it, it hurts so much. How can I do it? And maybe the answer is you should be doing that pose. Like, rethink the whole thing. Should you be doing that? Is that a help? Why are you here? I think it just what you're talking about goes to why are you sitting? Why are you in this studio? Are you yeah. in the studio to perfect a shopping list of shapes? Or are Ooh, you in this mm. studio to what, as I describe it, is mm. to better inhabit your body and mm, to nice. live your life in your body? Beautiful. Uh, which is what it sounds like you're talking about really very much. Well, yeah, because pain, if it's muscular pain, I know now through doing this for 30 years, if it's muscular pain, it's sensory motor amnesia the brain has just temporarily forgotten how to control that muscle group. So you can fight it all you want and stretch it all you want, but if, if the sensory motor cortex is not engaged, it will stay painful. And um, what did I want to say about that with the fitness? It's like, so, so when, you, when you learn how to regain control of the muscles, then you just naturally return back to an open state. Yeah. So it's more about wellness at that point. It's not about struggling or pushing past pain or strain ever. That's not a loving act to begin with. It's quite barbaric if you think about it. <laughs> like, you know, but it's something that we've been conditioned as a culture, I think. And again, I'm making mass generalizations. It's shifting now. I think the whole yoga world is shifting. Um, but what in our in general somatic yoga, we take advantage. Pain has a purpose. Pain is actually one of our best friends, like the breath. Pain is showing us where somewhere along in our life, we've disowned that part of ourself. The pain is coming from a signal that we're out of balance. So in general somatic yoga, instead of, instead of going away from pain, we're actually going to move into it through a pendiculation gently, and, and we, move, we move towards ourself. And then we slowly come out. And that's, again, part of the science of triggering the sensory motor cortex. So it's almost at the beginning when yoga teachers find this work, it's so non-intuitive. Like when I went to Korea, the, the students were like, what? Don't stretch? Like we just, we think if we have a pain, well then let's, let's, let's open it right away, right? And um, in general somatic yoga, we don't do that. We actually, if we find areas in our body that feel painful, then we, then we say, thank you body. And we move into it. It's almost like we kiss it, like, like we, we hug it, like a child that's crying. You know, we're just going to say hello to that part of our body. And in a very gentle way, we're just going to start unwinding that way. So that, that's, again, answering your question, the difference between traditional yoga and general somatic yoga. I feel like there will be people who listen to this who will be mad at me if I don't ask you about the other reflexes. Oh, okay. Okay. Sure, I'd be, <laughs> I'd be happy to. Because you said you would. Yes, and no problem. And in our webinar, I'm actually going to be um, giving PDF handouts that list these with details. So, um, all right. So we're going to talk about that in a second. But let's okay. let's do this, and then we'll okay. do that. Sure. Okay. So the startle reflex. Okay. So even animals do this. If you've ever seen animals hunting, when, once they're in that sympathetic state, they're on high alert. They actually like, crouch down close to the earth before they hunt. So the startle reflex, we talked about that. It's, it's more of a fear response, but it's, it's really literally to protect the front of our body. The green light reflex, um, I wish I could stand up right now. I can turn to the side, I suppose. So the red light reflex is more like this, okay? Mm -hmm. The green light reflex is, is like a call to action. It's, it's where the back muscles engage and it's imagine a, a soldier standing at attention right there's this posturing of the shoulders go back the chest is lifted the lower back is arched and it's like a bow and arrow we're ready to go we're ready to move forward and a lot of us that are a-type personalities and overachievers we have the green light reflex because we're ready to do the next thing the next thing the next thing and you can see this in postures. If, if you're ever in an area like standing in line for a movie, you can see these red light reflex, uh, these reflexes. Yeah. So the green light is a call to attention. It, it's ready to act. Um, and a lot of people that have lower back pain 
have the green light reflex. So it's a cue for yoga teachers and body workers to, to see this because the back muscles are tight. <clears throat> the trauma reflex, the third one, um, is usually involves a tilt and a torque. And it usually um, means that one side of the body is more contracted than the other. And it can come from various things. It can come from surgeries. Well, think of it if, like, like, I broke my arm at one point when I was younger. And they put me into a cast. And I don't know if this has happened to you or, or a viewer. When they take off the cast, the arm doesn't know how to go back down right away. It's still close to the body. Like, because when we're in pain, a, the, it's a reflex to protect our, you know, it's a, to protect ourselves. So the, the muscles stay frozen temporarily, sensory motor amnesia. And this side of, I'm using an analogy of my right arm, this side of the body becomes tighter than the other side. And so that creates more of a tilt or a torque. Other examples are sport players like golfers, baseball players, tennis players, using the same muscles over and over again, those muscles on that side of the body are going to be tighter. Another example, um, a lot of uh, mothers, especially if they have more than one child or grandmothers, grandfathers, they usually pick up, we have a habit of picking them up with one arm because especially mothers when they're multitasking, you know, babies in one arm, the other hand is doing something else. So let's just say that I'm picking a baby with left arm then over time, these muscles on my left side of the body are going to be more contracted than the right. Um, uh, accidents, uh, whiplash, um, car accidents, you know, that's unfortunately, that's just part of modern day life. Some people get into car accidents and there's this whipping motion or a rocking motion. So um, all of these things um, can create imbalances with just one side of the body. Mm -hmm. Trauma reflex. It usually comes from some kind of trauma. I'm giving awesome. you brief summaries. Okay, well, that's great. But you do have a course coming up where you're going to go into more detail about all of this called Creating Embodiment Through Somatic Awakening. Is that right? Yes, May 7th and 9th. <laughs> Did I guess correctly? Although it's on yes, my notes. <laughs> yes, yes, May 7th and 9th. And what's so great about it is I'm doing, a, um, for me, it's exciting because I'll be giving a half an hour lecture on May 7th and May 9th, and then a half an hour practice if people, if people choose. They can take the practices later as well. But it's really important for people to embody this. You know, we can talk about it, we can think about it, but the truth is, you know, with general somatic yoga, it's that introception. It's coming inside and making generative choices for ourselves, learning how to make generative choices for ourselves. And then there's a full um, one hour movement practice as a bonus. Um, where you put where it all I'm, together? Put it all together, yeah. yeah. So who uh, should take that course? Is it for yoga teachers? Is it for anybody who has a body? Is it for um, anybody students? who wants anybody who wants to be free? <laughs> 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 you know, I have uh, thirteen-year-old professional surfers that I work with. I have wow. ninety-one-year-old clients who broke you know, who had a hip replacement. So um, I think with this demographic, with Yoga U Online, I, I'm expecting there'll be a lot of yoga teachers that will be taking this webinar um, because you can learn the somatic movement flows. And just like I did when I developed it, you can immediately apply these flows into a traditional yoga class, whether you're a yoga therapist, whether you're a yin, yin yoga teacher, hatha yoga, vinyasa, ashtanga, it doesn't matter. You can, you can incorporate them because if anything, it could, if you can unwind your body a little bit and increase your, your range of motion 25% in one movement, then come into a yoga asana, you're just going to experience yourself in a whole different way, a safer way. So I, I'm, I'm expecting that will be a lot of the largest part of the demographic, but certainly not limited to, you know, the lay person who wants to learn more about themselves, take control of, of learning how to, um, to bring a greater awareness of self. It definitely busts the myth, the myth of aging. You know, when I first started this, when I first started this method, um, I really attracted the senior population, the active senior population, because you know most people think you just age and you just accept these postular imbalances. You know, the head forward and the kind of the shuffle. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that um, you know the the older generations, you know, 50 plus, 50, 60, 70, 
Um, they can modify all the somatic movement flows can be modified. So I hope that some, some of that demographic will take it. I think the other thing that really uh, would be uh, beneficial is the fact that it's not, you're not dealing in a uh, structure, a picture of this is what it's supposed to look like. You're really dealing in get into your body, find this connection and uh, see what happens when you, you know, connect those dots. You have tuned in so well. <laughs> I really appreciate our connection right now talking about this. You're absolutely right. And you used a word earlier about body shapes. Yeah. I love, to, I love using this term. Like it was very, very intuitive that you said that for me because it's true. It's each soma is going to discover their own shapes. Like the guidelines through the flows are to, are to explore that. But then there is this intuitive invitation at that point then to make it your own. You know, your, your, your body, your somatic intelligence will take over and it'll be like, ooh, that feels good. The practice feels, it's meant to feel good. Yeah. It's meant, you're meant to feel pleasure, you know. So um, definitely each person will express slightly different. Like I don't want them to look like me and I don't want them to look like their neighbor. Yeah. It's each person will go into it and go, wait a minute, what is this? Oh, wow. You know, there's just this process of, of, of awakening. Well, James, I feel better just talking to you about it. So I can't wait to oh, see what you do in the course. Thank you so and, much. And uh, thank you so much for talking to me today. Everyone who's tuning in, thank you for tuning in. We'll see you soon. Take James's course. It looks really good. Oh, it was a pleasure to, <laughs> it was a pleasure. to, to be Namaste. with you today. Namaste, Namaste. everyone. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.